at this event and now going to pass you over to him for the presentation. Great. Thanks, Clara, and hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for dialing in tonight. Um, I'm just going to share my slides before I get going. Um, as I'm going to speak for around sort of 45 minutes to an hour, depending how we get on. And um, then I say there'll be some time to kind of ask questions. Hopefully what we talk about today will spark some questions and obviously yeah, do sort of post those throughout. And then I'll, I'll come to the ones that maybe seem like they've had the most kind of upvotes or some other ones that are most relevant to what we've talked about. Um, as Clara already kind of introduced me, I'm currently working for the NHS, offering psychological therapy to people who have kind of common mental health difficulties. So that's often um, depression or a sort of form of anxiety. Um, also works sort of privately um, and for the NHS as a personal trainer and then have a sort of other role with Public Health England, which is about talking about the importance of physical activity for sort of physical and, and mental health. Um, and essentially, uh, I guess within my roles, we draw on lots of different disciplines to think about, um, you know, why we struggle to be healthy, um, complex human behavior, um, again, thinking things like neuroscience, evolutionary psychology, some of the behavioral sciences. Um, and I've included a reference list at the end of today. So if people are interested in finding out more, um, there's sort of further reading or things that people can kind of engage with. Today we have got a relatively short amount of time, so I guess in terms of what we can cover, you know, we could probably spend, um, you know, much, much longer talking about some of these topics, but I guess I want to sort of think about what are some of the reasons why we struggle to keep ourselves physically and mentally healthy, you know, we know um, it can be difficult at times, we know there are reasons why we struggle, but what are those reasons, and I guess if we have an awareness of those reasons, um, how that can help us uh, it will inform things that we can do about it you know what are the evidence-based approaches to kind of physical and mental well-being i'm going to talk a little bit about cbt which again is what i specialize in um, and how some of the ideas from that can help with recognizing and becoming aware of our thought processes our beliefs how that interacts with our physical and mental health and then also behavior change so thinking about um, habits health habits and kind of how we can change our behavior you know, and what we know about that kind of scientifically. I wanted to start with a little bit of context um, and I guess there is this sort of historical dualism that maybe exists within healthcare and particularly within the kind of differentiation between mental health and physical health. Um, there's almost this idea that historically the brain is sort of very separate from the body um, the brain is made of a different type of material. The brain is a different, um, almost exists in a different space. But I guess modern science is showing us more and more that the brain and the body are very, very interconnected. You know, whether that's kind of thinking about um, our immune system, inflammation, gut health, uh, how physically active we are, what we eat there's a two-way process between how we feel emotionally and how our bodies feel physically. And I guess when we're thinking about looking after our physical and mental health, often, again, they're very sort of intimately connected and we shouldn't necessarily separate them the way that, that sort of historically healthcare has. And I guess, again, you know, when thinking about something like mental health, which can have a very sort of complex um, set of circumstances that lead to someone feeling depressed or feeling anxious we want to think about psychological factors biological factors and social factors um, which again was proposed by George Engel in sort of the 70s but maybe hasn't had as much traction in terms of modern healthcare as maybe some professionals would think um, and again you see that slightly in the separation between certain healthcare services commissioned to deal purely with physical health certain healthcare services just commissioned to deal with mental health but actually there are you know we really want to view health in this kind of biopsychosocial model um, one of the sort of lenses i want to view this problem through is actually an evolutionary lens and again this goes back maybe to sort of historical ideas about nature versus nurture so how much of what we are and who we are is determined by our genes and how much of it is determined by the environments we find ourselves in and, and the culture that we've created. And I guess in reality, actually, this distinction is often a bit of a false one because 
all of the genetic um, or the genes that we inherit from our parents and from our ancestors have to exist within an environment. And actually a lot of the way that those genes are turned on or off is mediated by the environments that we find ourselves in. But I guess what we often see and what there's a lot of kind of um, research on now is the sort of underlying biology of what it means to be human. You know, what kind of animal are we, if you like, interacting with the sort of hyper novelty of modern environments and cultures are what often lead to more and more kind of mental and physical health problems. So if you look at that kind of um, sort of equation, if you like, on the slide, we evolved potentially in environments where there were scarce amounts of food um, and we needed to be very kind of energy efficient. We now live in environments where we have easy access to high calorie food without having to move much to get it. And what you see is that interaction between the way our bodies and brains are designed, interacting with culture to cause high prevalence of obesity and heart disease, because again, we're just not used to being in that environment. And again, I suppose we have to view this in sort of the vast expanse of time that we've been on this planet. You know, we um, have probably been around, again, the scientific consensus on that is about hundreds, 200,000 years. Um, if you think about what modern cultures look like now compared to what they look like then, they're very, very different. And again, we might sort of use that lens to think a little bit about physical and mental health conditions and why they, why they develop. Again, if we maybe use an example to illustrate this further, you know, if you think about something like physical activity, um, you know, exercise, something that we know is good for us, but probably all at times find it really difficult to engage in enough um, physical activity or exercise um, than would be best for our health. Well, if we think about us, you know, the, the environment that we evolved in, actually moving for the sake of exercise would not necessarily be good for our survival. You know, we need to, to kind of conserve calories. Um, it would only have made sense to move when we really needed to, you know, either to find food or to socialize or to find a mate. Um, and actually, that's meant that we potentially evolved ways of thinking and behaving that make it um, more adaptive to rest when we don't need to. Again, the, um, evolutionary anthropologist Daniel Lieberman who's written a lot about this and again I just wanted to share a couple of quotes from him so you know from the perspective of natural selection when calories are limited it always makes sense to divert energy from non-essential physical activity towards reproduction or other functions that maximize reproductive success even if these trade-offs lead to ill health and shorter lifespans and I guess what he's meaning by that is you know we need to grapple with the problem that engaging in voluntary physical activity for the sake of health and fitness is a bizarre, modern and optional behaviour. You know, our brains help us avoid physical activity when it's neither necessary or fun. So this idea that we should all just, you know, be able to be as active as we need to be, we should all exercise because it's good for us. Well, actually, if we view it through this evolutionary lens, we can see why we might struggle. You know, we can see why um, it's difficult for us to be as active as we, we should be or could be for good health. I guess those kind of historical causes interacting with more kind of proximal environmental current causes you know we're living in hyper novel environments we have access again to super high calorie processed food um, smartphones um, you know living in kind of smaller groups you know the nuclear family maybe on our own you know increasing um, kind of isolation versus living in kind of groups or tribes that would have kind of been um, more kind of close-knit We've got a lot of kind of opportunities for instant gratification. So again, that kind of um, some of those hyper novel things that are kind of available now. And again, if we think about this through the lens of physical activity, we can get our food, we can socialize without having to move. You know, we don't have to expend um, calories unless we, you know, are doing it maybe for the sake of um, something that we really enjoy or something that's kind of um, been scheduled for us. Um, but that can often make it harder. It can mean our motivation is lower. It can mean that we're not feeling as, um, as motivated because it's not connected to something that's necessary um, you know, for our survival. So I guess it's just, again, that interaction between 
the kind of evolved bodies and brains that we have and the modern culture and the kind of factors that um, influence our health and, and kind of well-being. Again, linking this to mental health, well, again, thinking about how common mental health is, you know, again, we often see these stats, kind of one in four people experience a mental health problem of some kind each year, um, one in six in any given week. Um, we know globally mental health um, problems are a huge burden in terms of um, individual suffering, you know, affecting quality of life, affecting kind of productivity. And again, thinking about what we just talked about, we might think about this idea that the environments we're in, how much do those contribute to the mental health or the kind of suffering that we're experiencing? Um, and I guess we might kind of ask ourselves that question, do the modern environments that we live in promote good, good mental health? And again, that's not to say that um, I think we should all go back and live <laughs> in the way that we did 100,000 years ago. Obviously, there are some great things about modern life and obviously, you know, they create um, incredible sort of opportunities for us and kind of quality of life, you could argue, is significantly better. But I guess it's just thinking, are there also factors that kind of um, have that darker side or that kind of side that makes us um, feel worse psychologically? I guess link idea is thinking about emotions. So again, when we're talking about mental health, we're actually often thinking about um, emotions where there's a sort of element where they've become chronic and ingrained because of the environments we find ourselves in. And emotions are normally aimed at kind of helping us to um, achieve a goal or respond to an environmental pressure that's kind of on us. So, you know, if we think about anger, often that's because we feel that like there's been some sense of injustice and we want to kind of rectify it. I think about anxiety, we're often responding to some form of danger or threat, you know, whether that's a kind of perceived danger in terms of the way we're thinking about it or genuine danger, like a car's driving towards us and we need to kind of jump out the way of it. And again, was there are loads and loads of other emotions that we haven't named here, but I guess what we're saying is here that emotions are really normal in response to certain sort of environmental circumstances that we might find ourselves in. And I guess this has led you to think about, well, what are some of the reasons that people often become distressed mentally? So if we think about things like anxiety and depression, well, there are certain environmental factors that we know are likely to contribute to feeling that way. So, you know, we are trying to achieve something in our life and that's constantly blocked. You know, we're just not able to get to where we want to go. Um, you know, that can really trigger a sense of kind of wanting to give up or reducing motivation. Um, you know, comparing ourselves to others in favour, you know, feeling that we're not as good as other people. Um, adverse life experiences in terms of our upbringing, um, any trauma that we might have experienced, you know, that can really shape um, how we feel. Again, we obviously know that loss and bereavement can trigger sort of strong feelings of sadness and, and low mood. Um, and again, there are sort of some other ones on there where I guess it's thinking about what are the environmental factors that are contributing to how we feel and kind of maybe contributing to that um, feeling of depression. Likewise, with anxiety, we know um, lots of uncertainty, conflict, lack of control, um, or lack of kind of information that might kind of be important to us can contribute to feelings of anxiety. Um, thinking about kind of exposure to threats and anxiety provoking information, um, that can have a big fact, impact on sort of how anxious and how stressed we feel day to day. Um, and we put that, put that sort of equation on the slide there because I guess sometimes we think about at any given moment, our brain is kind of evaluating um, the awfulness of something happen, happening, how likely it might be, and that kind of contributes into how anxious we'll feel about the situation. But then that's often mediated by feeling, well, how well would we cope if it did happen? And is there anything that can kind of help us if it was to happen? You know, are there people that could um, rescue or kind of help us cope? Or do we feel very isolated and, and kind of unable to cope if that bad thing was gonna happen? And sort of depending on the different parts of that equation might depend how we actually feel in that moment. Um, I guess, and again, just to kind of summarise here, I suppose what I'm trying to say really is that 
these feelings and these emotions and these responses are really really common you know and again often hit the environmental factors that help making it feel this way and kind of again interacting with our sort of um, the way our brains and bodies are built um, so i guess knowing and thinking a little bit about our life context and the things that are happening to us at the moment and the way that we're thinking and behaving can help us become a little bit more reflective and think about, well, what can we do about that if we're noticing some of these factors in ourselves? and i guess what we're going to talk about in a moment is when we become aware of some of those emotions some of those feelings you know some of those kind of difficulties that might be kind of ongoing we need to bring awareness to what are some of the factors that are contributing to that to then make changes and kind of do something about it so i guess there's so much out there about how we can manage our mental health how we can improve our physical health you know build better habits um, think more positively you know there's a huge industry of self-help which is worth you know kind of billions and billions of pounds a year but i suppose what i want to try really focus on here is what is evidence-based you know what is scientific what do we know can actually help with these things because again there's so much out there that's more kind of um subjective you know it works for some people but it, it's never really been kind of tested on a mass scale i guess some of these things here which again so we're not going to have time today to go into all of these in detail are kind of evidence-based um or at least kind of have some evidence to support them as things that can be helpful so you know some of these are really common sense you know things like being physically active kind of moving more um you know spending time in green space or green areas um connecting socially or having good social connections getting enough sleep um psychological therapy we know has a particularly things like cbt have a strong evidence base behind them in terms of um helping to improve sort of mental mental health um, and some of the things connected here would be sort of things like reframing thoughts um, ideas from mindfulness um, establishing a routine you know finding things that are purposeful and meaningful to pursue and then working towards those um, medication as well you know again there's a little bit of controversy there in terms of how helpful medication is and whether the research is a little bit biased but we know that there is evidence that supports medication that you know can be helpful um, for mental health difficulties so what we're going to kind of focus on today is more some of the ideas we can take from psychological therapy and how that can change you know help us kind of manage mental and physical health um i wanted to talk about cbt because again it's my uh main sort of training background is in cbt this is a kind of therapy that was developed in the 70s by um psychiatrist named aaron beck and i guess it moved away from some of the more traditional models of understanding psycho you know psychological distress or kind of mental health problems which was often um either quite kind of freudian so uh locating kind of all of the problems as within the relationships uh, with parents and childhood and the kind of development of the child or very behavioral which was just looking at kind of the, the learned behaviors that are associated with mental health difficulties cognitive behavioral therapy very much focused on the way that we construct the world with our beliefs and narratives that come up so we're going to talk about that in a moment but in terms of the distress we experience at any given moment can be very much related to the interpretation or the meaning that we give that event um, and it was very much focused in the here and now so it's very much kind of focused on what can we kind of practically do about some of the symptoms that are emerging in terms of depression or kind of anxiety um, and again it's, it's one of the most kind of widely tested types of therapy in the world um, it's got kind of lots of uh, randomized control trials meta-analyses um, and other kind of um, research sort of supporting its efficacy that's not to say it's the only therapy and again some people say that the reason cbt has so much evidence behind it is just because of a kind of bias in wanting something um, that kind of works in the short term and again there are definitely other types of therapy which can be helpful to people but i guess i just wanted to um, talk about this one today in terms of it being quite practical and, and kind of um, ideas from it can be quite useful and i guess this is a simple diagram which often we use in cbt to help sort of reflect a little bit on um, 
psychological distress or kind of how um, the links between these different areas are kind of um, connecting with how we feel. So again, the real idea here is that the situation we find ourselves in is often not a cause primarily of the distress, but it's actually the mental or the way that we think about that situation. So just as a kind of example, you know, let's say I woke up tomorrow morning and I had a really dull pain in both my legs. And as soon as I got out from bed, it, you know, the pain intensified. I find it difficult to walk. I was, you know, just noticing this real kind of soreness in my legs. How might I feel in that moment? Well, if I know that I'd been to the gym yesterday and done an intense workout, which involves squats, lunges, deadlifts, the explanation I'd have for that pain would be very different. You know, I might even feel a sense of kind of satisfaction of, oh, that was a good workout. You know, I kind of feel the pain, you know, that shows that I did something good. Um, and then my behavioral response might be to kind of just, you know, keep walking, you know, not necessarily kind of change what I do that day, um, even though I might sort of notice that pain. But I guess think about that situation if I hadn't been to the gym yesterday, you know, if I had no explanation for why that pain was there how that might change my emotion. You know, would that kind of make me feel anxious? Would I be looking for an explanation of why that pain is there? How might that change my behavior? You know, maybe I'd sort of feel like I need to go to hospital. You know, maybe I'd kind of rest. Um, and I guess the links between these areas often kind of construct our experiences because we're, um, again, the way we're thinking or construing that event, um, yeah, really changes our emotional reaction to it. And equally, I guess, the physiology of how we're feeling, you know, if we're, um, you know, if we're feeling something in our body, you know, if we're, um, you know, if we've not been moving enough that day, or if we haven't had enough sleep, that's going to really impact how we see the world, that's going to really impact how emotionally we feel. So I guess the idea here is that these areas interact and really impact on, again, our emotions, our thoughts, our behaviours and our physiology. Again, one of the things we help people do in the PDP is to actually notice how we're thinking. Now, a lot of the time we don't really pay attention to our thought processes. You know, we're aware that we might be thinking, but we're not necessarily noticing the content of what we're thinking or kind of the emotional valence of what we're thinking. So what we try and do is actually say, okay, well, we want to kind of almost get into that process and say, okay, well, what are the sort of patterns that come up in my thinking? And again, we often use this term negative automatic thoughts to help people notice how they might be thinking when they're feeling low or when they're feeling anxious. The idea is that we have these automatic reactions to things and we often just assume that because we've reacted in a certain way, the thoughts or the way we constructed or interpreted that event is correct. Um, but actually what we know is we're very prone to seeing things in a certain way in a biased way um, and if we can kind of step back from that process and start to notice how we're thinking that gives us um, sort of a chance to kind of reappraise or you know reinterpret that event using a sort of slightly more objective stance um, again we often see this as sort of a the way that we think in, in a sort of mental filter so you know this is a kind of relatively silly example but if we think about um, compliments or things that people say that are either neutral or positive how much we pay attention to those maybe one person in our day says something you know negative to us which is the comment that often sticks with us more and particularly if we're going through you know anxiety or depression we'll tend to notice that it's the, the negative comment or the one that kind of you know, we really sort of focus in on and interpret things in that way so we're almost kind of filtering out the other information only paying attention to the information that um, maybe kind of fits with how we're feeling or kind of yeah sort of um, fits with the depressed mood that we're in i guess a sort of uh, another little metaphor to think about this would be um this kind of idea of visual illusions now many of you will have seen this before um if you have seen it, you'll know that although these lines may look like they're different lengths, they're actually the same length. So the line at the top is the exact same length as the line at the bottom. And again, the way that we're wired, we tend to see them as different lengths. But what we can learn through experience is actually when I see that visual illusion, 
I know that I'm seeing two lines that are the same length. So we're almost kind of correcting for our automatic interpretation, you know, our, our bias and perception that kind of comes up here. And I guess to some extent, that's again, a bit of a metaphor for if we notice patterns of thinking that continually come up for us, we can learn to step back from that and view it um, through a different way or, or kind of, you know, reconstruct it in a way that's more helpful for us. I won't go through all of these, but some of these thinking styles of what we tend to look at in depression, but also can just come up generally, you know, when we're kind of going through our daily life. So um, we might be very prone to mind reading. So I assume I know what other people are thinking about me, but actually what evidence do I have that that's true? You know, do I, do I actually know that person's thinking that or am I kind of um, basing this on past experience or experiences that I've had? Um, with other people before, but it's not actually relevant to this situation here. Um, reasoning with our emotions. So I'm having a stressful day, I'm feeling quite anxious. Therefore, this situation is now being interpreted through that anxious lens and I'm kind of seeing it as much more catastrophic or um, you know, like something's really likely to go wrong. Um, we might look at things like being very self-critical, you know, again, how much am I still taking full responsibility for something that's gone wrong or something that um, maybe hasn't gone as I'd planned? Is that fair? You know, do I deserve 100% of the blame or are there other factors or kind of um, people that might be involved? Um, black and white thinking, again, we're very good at this in terms of human beings. So seeing things as either sort of 100% good or 100% bad, you know, a person is either 100% good or 100% bad. A situation is either really good or really bad well actually often there are shades of gray you know often things aren't great but they're also not terrible and how much are we tending to see things in that very black and white way um and is there a way of kind of stepping back from that catastrophizing um you know again imagining the worst thing is going to happen worrying a lot about the future and viewing things in a kind of very catastrophic way I guess what I just say at this point, and again, this may be linked to the, the one on there that um, mentions memories, is often these thinking habits and these thinking styles are shaped by our experience. So I guess, you know, if we've had um, experiences in our upbringing, um, if we've been treated a certain way by certain people, you know, if we tend to kind of compare ourselves to other people and view ourselves unfavorably, you know, again, this is where there is that interaction between environmental factors. Um, and kind of how we tend to think. Um, and again, often our, our mind is viewing things in a certain way because we've had experiences that fit with that narrative um, in the past. And again, I suppose the, the key thing here is to sometimes recognize why I'm thinking in certain ways and how I'm thinking um, so that we have more of a choice uh, rather than just kind of following that, um, you know, that narrative or that interpretation of a situation um, kind of immediately. Um, and again, this might be something that we think about with people who are getting people to monitor their thoughts, you know, so I notice a change in my emotion, you know, I notice I'm feeling anxious. Well, what was happening just before then? You know, was there something happening, um, you know, in my day? Did something just happen? Did I just get an email? Did someone say something to me? Was I just thinking about something? How, how did I feel in my body? You know, what emotions came up? You know, was it anxiety? Was it stress? Did my body start, did my heart start to beat really fast? And what was going through my mind? You know, was there something about the way I was interpreting that situation that made me feel that way? You know, so maybe someone said something that was relatively innocuous, um, like, I don't know, uh, could you send me this document? But I interpreted that as they thought I should have sent it weeks ago. And actually there was a kind of criticism in their voice. How much is that me bringing that to the table or how much is that kind of actually the situation that was there so i guess we're sort of seeing that link between emotions thoughts body sensations and the situation itself i guess this is quite relevant to the talk and this is actually an analogy we, <laughs> analogy we do use in cbt where we talk about actually kind of really interrogating our thought and then again this metaphor of sort of taking a thought to court um so okay what happens? How did I feel? What were the thoughts that came up in relation to that situation? And can we almost kind of weigh up the evidence that supports that way of thinking? You know, so these are, this is the evidence that this did actually happen. And, you know, this is the way that um, 
my interpretation is correct but is there also evidence that would suggest that's not true you know so what what kind of other evidence could we generate if we were speaking to a friend in this situation you know what would we say would we say yeah you know your interpretation is absolutely correct i can see exactly why you think that or would we be saying actually have you taken into account these factors you know are there other things that might mean that um you're, you're sort of thinking in a slightly unhelpful way or you're not kind of seeing this exactly how it is um, and, and based on doing that can we come to some kind of balanced perspective of what might actually be going on or you know a sort of different way of viewing it um, now again this is really hard you know again and I'm sort of um, going through this relatively quickly but I guess if we can practice this and get used to recognizing those patterns and sort of interrogating our thoughts in this way that can actually help us again um, have a slightly more balanced view and um, prevent us from thinking in these slightly unhelpful ways. I guess to some extent our thinking does connect to how we actually talk to ourselves and how we relate to ourselves. And again, this can be a mixture of sort of our upbringing, the culture we find ourselves in, um, the way that we yeah, sort of have relationships with other people. But I guess we might think of this analogy of like, like two different coaches. So you know, if I was going to um, take a child to learn a, a new sport, for example, so let's say it's football, so you take your child to training and they can have the choice of two coaches. You've got coach A that whenever the child makes a mistake, they're going to yell at them. They're going to say, you know, you're really terrible at this. I really don't know why you bother to turn up today. I just can't see how you're ever going to improve. You're just not good enough. You know, you really don't have a future in this sport and I you know don't bother continuing and then you've got coach b that says you know I think there's some things we can work on together um I wonder if actually you know through doing a training program we could find ways of improving um you know I can see some parts of your game that you need to work on um you know let's think about doing that together and kind of working through that I guess that question of well, which which coach would get better results you know which coach would help the person kind of stick at um, learning that skill or kind of playing that sport versus which coach would make us kind of want to give up and which coach would kind of want us to, um, you know, maybe make us feel much worse about ourselves emotionally. I guess what often happens is, although we can sort of rationally see that the compassionate coach is probably going to have better outcomes, we tend to relate to ourselves very much in that bullying way, you know, in that kind of self-critical way. Um, so I guess there's something here about that way of relating to yourself and can we kind of foster um, more self-compassion. Final part on thoughts before we move on to thinking about behaviours is just we often else also help people notice when we've kind of internalised stories or narratives about our life that kind of unconsciously guide us um, in ways that maybe we're not aware of so again this is definitely related to again culture upbringing but these might not necessarily show up as kind of conscious obvious thoughts in relation to a situation like we just talked about there might be more things like i don't feel good enough you know i always feel like i have to prove myself to others um, i'm not the kind of person who does exercise um, I can't say no to people because otherwise they'll kind of judge me negatively. These kind of rules and assumptions often very much unconsciously kind of influence our behaviour. And actually, again, by becoming more conscious of the way that we're living our life and seeing um, the sort of narratives and the stories that we're um, living by can help us kind of work through those, um, either through doing kind of self-reflection or through again sort of psychological therapy or kind of talking to people about um, the way those are impacting on our life so for just some food for thought maybe kind of um, to take away from today so in terms of thoughts we might think about well how could I foster being more compassionate to myself you know what would that look like um, you know does that mean doing more for myself does that mean actually kind of um, giving myself permission to do certain things I wouldn't normally give myself permission to do. Um, am I prone to any unhelpful thinking styles? Maybe the ones that I kind of put on the slides or just ones that you've noticed already. And, you know, what rules am I unconsciously following? Am I living kind of certain narratives out that 
don't feel good and kind of cause me to feel bad. Um, and these are all the kind of things that people can work on themselves when we start to become more self-aware of these processes, but also things that kind of sometimes get covered in therapy and then things that kind of we help people work through. I want to also just talk a little bit about behavior change because again this is a big part of CBT and a big part of kind of helping people to live kind of um, become more sort of psychologically and physically healthy. Um, and I guess really you know often when we're talking about behavior change we use this term habit you know we know that we should have good health habits we should be exercising more eating better um, spending less time on screens you know sleeping well and I guess often there's a focus in these conversations about the behavior we need to do you know we need to just exercise our willpower and then we'll be able to do the habits or engage in the habits that make us you know healthier happier people but I guess what's often neglected is that actually a lot of the research shows that the behavior is only one part of the equation and actually the environmental cues or the environment we find ourselves in often massively shapes how likely it is that we'll behave in certain ways and equally the way that we that a certain behavior triggers the reward system in our brain is very much connected to how likely it is that it will be built in and kind of remembered in a positive light in our brain in a way that reinforces it into a habit. I guess just to kind of give a couple of concrete examples of this, you know, when we're talking about addiction, you know, often the reason certain substances are addicted to us is because they actually re-trigger this reward system. So whether it's nicotine, cigarettes, alcohol, um, you know, cocaine, other kind of substances, they're essentially hijacking this reward system in our brain, which means that we really quickly start to crave and want that again. Um, and uh, again, I'll, I'll talk about this more in a moment, but there are certain things that we're sort of biologically wired to really easily form habits around. Equally, you know, it's things like smartphone use, notifications, emails, often the cues are actually in the software that we use. So, you know, we know that smartphones send us notifications, we get pop-ups in emails, we get distracted by kind of news stories that are very sort of clickbaity and make us want to kind of read it. And often these are actually fulfilling a need for distraction or, you know, actually we're really busy, we're really stressed. If I just click that, you know, maybe give me a little bit of sort of temporary relief, it will be quite a nice, you know, distraction or, you know, even a notification can be kind of, um, rewarding in a way um, because it makes us feel good but I guess notice that when we're talking about the reward system and the cues again there are probably certain things which are going to be easier to reinforce so if we think back to our kind of evolutionary story generally we're quite wired to really like things that are sugary and fatty and give us kind of instant reward because biologically speaking they would have been very good for our survival you know if we came across that um, 100,000 years ago, that would be a major win for us. But obviously living in an environment where there's abundant calories and, you know, we don't have to leave the sofa to get what we want. Um, actually, those things are potentially um, unhelpful to form into habits. Um, and, and again, notice that some healthy behaviours that we might think don't have an instant gratification, you know, physical activity or exercise can be quite unpleasant in the moment. You know, eating broccoli probably isn't as rewarding as eating a donut. Um, so actually sometimes it's more, we need to almost construct what that reward is. You know, is it helping us move towards a goal, which is to feel physically better? Um, you know, we know there can be mood benefits to moving. So is it actually that the reward system is, I want to feel, less stressed or I want to improve my mood because I've moved well that is a reward that can be quite tangible and help us to form habits equally is the environment one that fosters movement or fosters that healthy behavior um, there's actually some evidence I think that if you live closer to lots and lots of fast food or takeaways you're statistically more likely to be overweight now, is that just because the people that live closer to takeaways have lower willpower? Probably not. You know, it's probably more likely that um, it's just more temptation. You know, there's more, there's more opportunity 
to engage in unhealthy behaviours. Um, so I suppose, again, the, the, the idea here is that we're focusing partly on the reward and partly on the environmental factors that are contributing to the habits and the behaviours that I'm starting to form. Now, some of the ideas from the CBT that can help us to engage and kind of get inside this process, some of them are really straightforward. But I guess there's this idea of actually committing to a time and a place where we can engage in, you know, a certain behaviour. So if I do want to walk more, you know, I could say, well, next, you know, this upcoming week, I want to increase my walking. Well, I haven't really made a plan there. You know, that's quite an abstract thing. I could easily put that off if I feel stressed with something like activity scheduling we're actually saying i want i'm going to write down and commit to when i'm going to engage in this health behavior or this behavior that i know is important to me so at 6 or 6 30 i'm going to walk to my local park by myself you know i want to reconnect more with my friends right i'm going to message james seven o'clock on wednesday i'm going to talk to him on the phone we're kind of making a commitment to that act rather than just saying oh, I'll do it at some point in the future where we know we're very prone to kind of put that off get distracted do other things instead when we're thinking about environmental cues well what's my living space like where do I live you know do I have easy access to places that make it easy to say be active or to eat well or am I kind of in an environment which really there's lots of temptation around you know how close is my phone to me every day? If my phone is buzzing 24 seven, how easy is it for me to just use my willpower and you know, I'm really not gonna look at my phone versus if I turned it off and put it away somewhere. You know, if I don't have any donuts in the house, how easy is it for me to go and get one? You know, <laughs> these are the kind of contextual factors where we sometimes need to think about what are the environment, you know, how can we design our environment to make it more likely that we'll follow through with our good intentions? Um, and again, these can be small things as well. You know, these could be things like, well, if I want to create a habit of doing, say, stretching in the morning, could I have my yoga mat out on the floor, you know, in my living room? So it's kind of ready for me to go. You know, do I know where my, um, the clothes I'd want to go walking in are and are they easily accessible? Um, is my TV plugged in with the remote on the sofa where it's really tempting to just sit down, turn it on, or could it be unplugged? So that actually if I have to watch something, it's much more of a conscious decision to engage in that behavior. And again, these are things where if we're conscious of what's impacting on our ability to engage in healthy habits, we can actually make changes that sometimes make a big difference. Again, what just one from my own personal life is taking my phone out of my immediate environment so like I said put it in the bedroom um, turn it off you know that can really help you from being distracted or kind of um, not doing something you know where I sort of end up that I've just scrolled for an hour and not done the thing that I wanted to do um, and I guess linked to that idea is that we sometimes have certain contexts where it doesn't matter what our intentions were when we find ourselves here our motivation just drops off a cliff you know, again, that could be the sofa, that could be the computer, could be when we're on our smartphone, could be when we're with certain people. But I guess if we notice that that's happening, we can then sometimes plan our environment and our context in a way that helps us to be less distracted, you know, be less likely to engage in kind of um, or reduction in motivation. I guess we talked a little bit about the reward aspect of habit building, and I guess there is this idea that we can use something called reward substitutions. This is Dan Ariely. He's done a lot of work in kind of behavioral economics and psychology. And he's a big advocate of this idea of reward substitution, where I guess it's the idea that if we know we don't enjoy a particular behavior, but we know it's good for us, can we combine it with something that is more enjoyable? So, you know, an, an idea here might be like an audio book or a podcast. I know I really enjoy listening to that, but I'm only going to allow myself to do it when I'm out for a walk or I'm out for a run. Um, are there kind of other things we can use to positively reinforce that behavior, even if it's something we know that we don't enjoy as much um, or kind of it wouldn't be something that we're instantly drawn to do. And I guess a lot of this kind of research can also be summarized by the idea, which again, sounds like complete common sense, but when we actually think about it, um, 
can be quite deep, which is if we want people to change their behavior, we want to make it as easy as possible for them to do that, to do so. Again, this is from Paul Dolan, who's done a lot of work on kind of um, behavioral change. And I guess, again, a lot of what I've just said, talked about really here is reducing the friction towards behaviors that we know are good and maybe increasing the friction on behaviors that we know are bad. So again, to use a, one of the examples I mentioned, making sure that we don't have food that we don't want to eat in the house, making sure that we're really kind of primed and cued and it's easy to be more physically active through certain kind of, um, again, changes in how we arrange our environment. So I guess it's a slight change in terms of, we just need to engage our willpower. We just need to think, um, you know, just need to kind of really steal ourselves and push through. You know, like, I'm not saying that can't work. Sometimes that does work. And sometimes we have really strong willpower. But I guess it's terms of a long-term consistent strategy for building habits, particularly new habits, um, tends not to be quite as effective uh, in the long term. Again, just something to kind of think about here in terms of how can we design our environment in a way that might encourage um, active, kind of more healthy behaviours. So I'm aware of time, and we're, we're nearly at the end here, I think, and then we'll move to Q&A. I guess, just to sort of summarise what we've covered so far, we talked about the interactions between our underlying biology that evolved in certain contexts and how the interaction of that with modern environments often causes um, many of the sort of mental and physical health problems that we might experience. We've thought about how difficult emotions and mental health difficulties are very normal. You know, they arise in certain environmental conditions. They reflect our kind of upbringing or the ways that kind of we are um, in our, you know, in culture and in kind of in our interactions with other people. We've thought about a few different ways um, that you might help manage or improve kind of mental and physical health. And again, we've used some of the ideas from CBT to think about thinking styles and behavior and how we can kind of maybe affect those um, with some kind of strategies. I wanted just to mention a few resources because again, I know we've covered a lot in a quite short space of time. And obviously again, you could go into a lot of these things in, in much more detail and, and maybe we will a little bit in the Q&A. Um, Clara was gonna mention maybe a little bit about the LinkedIn's in org.uk website which is again very much about kind of well-being um, so I'll, I'll let her talk to that maybe in a, in a moment if people have questions on it um, there are some self-help resources which kind of again build on ideas from cbt think about kind of mental health there's also some really good charities so mind the calm zone rethink um, there's a lot of kind of resources and information there about mental health and what we can you know where we can seek support what kind of things we can engage with and that link at the bottom, which is really long, but again, when I send the slides out, you'll have that link, is actually where you can source local therapies, depending where you live. Um, so if you were interested in kind of um, potentially talking to a therapist or speaking about some of these ideas in more detail, um, you can access kind of NHS funded therapy using that link just by putting your postcode in. Um, Clara, I don't know if you want to say anything about the Inconsing website there. Yeah, um, just to mention, and I have put this in the chat, there are a number of resources on the members section of our website under wellbeing. So schemes that the Bar Council run for um, barristers and judges as well. So please do go have a look if you're interested in the various different counselling services and also charities, legal charities that offer um, wellbeing resources too. And just to mention that all of these slides we will upload to the website too. So if you um would like to check back in a couple of days and i'll email everyone who's attended tonight too great i say just just added to that i mean again the last two slides are just uh, um loads of references so again some of these are books that kind of go into these topics in much more detail some of them have got papers relating to some of the stuff we've talked about but um yeah if you are interested in finding out more uh, this reference list is quite a good um resource just in terms of reading more about this for yourself um so i will stop sharing there um and again i'm aware that was sort of very much a whistle stop tour and i'm just going to look at the chat to see if any of these are kind of q and a's that have come through or people have just put chats on there clara i don't know if you've been sort of monitoring that um we've got 
one from Shilpa who's asking why are certain traits and habits hardwired into us due to biology or ancestors lifestyle but this mm. does not change as quickly as we do when we've moved on oh yeah I see this yeah yeah and I think really the answer to that is partly just about time you know if we <laughs> think about traits potentially being inherited over many 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 generations um actually the 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 modern environments we're living in are very novel you know and they you know only in the last sort of 100 200 years have we had maybe as much um easy access to things and actually for those traits to change over you probably need you know hundreds of thousands of years for those things to actually kind of affect our biology more deeply um, I don't know if that's kind of making sense, but I guess it's, it's partly that sort of um, mismatch in time between culture changing much faster than our kind of genes can keep up. Um, yeah, I don't know if that's answered the question, but yeah, hopefully that's kind of what you were alluding to. Right. Um, if anyone does have any questions, feel free. Josh has kindly agreed to stay on the line to answer any, and they, they can be anonymous as well if you are not yeah. comfortable putting your name. It's the Q&A tab at the bottom or on the chat. We did have a couple sent in advance, so maybe we... Yeah, I was going to say, I can go to a couple of those if that's helpful. Yeah. Um, I think someone sent one through about um, dealing with sort of multiple interruptions by email and kind of how that can be really distracting. And I get... And I, I suppose just thinking about the effect on concentration and um, I guess one thing I was thinking about was again the idea of like habits being very much influenced by the environment so if we do have emails constantly pinging at us how difficult it is to actually avoid the temptation to kind of get distracted and go off task and I suppose setting up maybe um, the software on our computer or even just shutting down emails while we're trying to work on one thing at a time is probably a more effective strategy than trying to like you know just resist the urge to check or to kind of go into those things um, I think there was a couple more that I was going to just touch on if someone had said someone had said what are the three most important habits that a person can adopt in their everyday life in order to achieve the balanced psychological and physical health that's um, quite a difficult one to answer I mean I guess in terms of the sort of evidence base and where there is the most I mean I would say being physically active and I guess the government suggests in terms of the evidence base that doing 150 minutes a week of moderate intensity physical activity so that's kind of things which get our heart rate up, not necessarily to the point of feeling kind of completely exhausted or overexerted, but, you know, we definitely notice that we're kind of slightly working harder than we would if we were just sort of lightly walking or not doing much. That is massively correlated with huge benefits in health, you know, reduction of risk for things like diabetes, heart disease, some cancers, depression, anxiety, so in terms of bang for your buck, you know, being phys as physically active as we need to be for good health definitely has a massive impact on our physical and mental well-being. Sleep as well, which again I know I alluded to, there's a lot of evidence that getting a good night's sleep and giving ourselves enough time to sleep, which generally the evidence shows is around sort of six to eight hours a day. You know, again, I know modern lifestyles don't always give us the opportunity to sleep that much. But if we can make time and prioritise sleep, that's likely to have a big impact. And I guess the, the third thing I would say there is probably stress. And obviously stress can mean so many different things. You know, that can mean um, external pressures coming from job, family, relationships, you know, other kind of factors that we couldn't foresee, but also kind of internal pressure that we put on ourselves, you know, again, in terms of having very high standards pushing ourselves, <clears throat> you know working really long hours but the effect of stress on the body is definitely very negative in the long term you know it, it can kind of really affect our physiology and um, again linked to lots of kind of health and psychological problems if we have sort of chronically stressful environments 
<clears throat> so I suppose my third one would probably be sort of finding ways of managing stress. <laughs> now, obviously, that can be a bit ambiguous. Um, but yeah, that, that can be kind of that can be through therapy, that could be through um, relaxation, making time for things that allow us to switch off, um, breathing, mindfulness. You know, there's there's loads and loads of different ways that we probably don't have time to go into. But I think trying to mitigate some of the effects of stress would be potentially an important one. Um, I've seen a few. I don't know, I'm just seeing a few questions come through on the Q and A. <laughs> That's quite a funny one at the top there. Do ugly buildings make us depressed? Um, I don't know if there's much evidence of that, to be honest, but I know that obviously we're not very adapted to living in, I mean, in terms of like buildings themselves, I guess there probably are certain um, aesthetics that are more pleasing to us, but uh, I don't know in terms of the evidence around that. Maybe someone could do a research study on it. Um, as a species, are we on a one-way road to ill health? Uh, oh, that's just the situation is getting worse and worse. Should the government be doing more, and if so, what? Yeah, I mean, again, I've probably painted quite a bleak picture, and I hope I haven't made people feel too pessimistic. I mean, obviously, there are great things about modern cultures in terms of health, you know, and obviously, modern healthcare is prolonging life, and you know. I guess the other thing to say is, you know, availability of abundant calories means that less and less people are starving in the world. <laughs> and, you know, that's been a problem in human history. So I'm not trying to kind of say that every modern um, modern cultural innovation is impacting on our, men on our health negatively. But I suppose there is this kind of interaction, as you've probably kind of seen what, when, what I've talked about, where if we just allow ourselves to continually you know have the things that we want to have because we're biologically wired to want them that can mean that we you know we're less able to resist temptation we're less able to kind of concentrate on things um and we have to kind of really think about that in terms of our own health and take some kind of personal responsibility because i'm not sure that um society is necessarily going to push us in the direction to live healthier lives um, Again, I'm not sure if that fully answered the question, but I think, uh, yeah, maybe that's related. Um, okay, let's just look at a few more. I want to talk, what someone's asked about tips for treating yourself more compassionately. And I think that's a topic that comes up a lot when we talk about mental health, because I guess to some extent it's easy to say, start treating yourself more compassionately, but it's actually really hard to do. There is a website, which is, I think if you just type in compassion.org, um, there's a psychologist called Christy Neff, who's done a lot of research into compassionate um, or ways of treating yourself more compassionately. And there are some really good exercises on there, which can help us to sort of tap into that mindset. I guess what we might also want to be aware of with that is any barriers to compassion that might link to beliefs we have about what it would mean to treat ourselves compassionately so I guess what I mean by that is do we sort of link compassion with you know I'd be sort of um, a sense of weakness or kind of like I you know I'd be treating myself too kindly and it would mean I wouldn't achieve anything in life or um, you know if I treat myself compassionately then um, you know I'm not pushing myself as much as I should and again actually sometimes we misattribute compassion to mean, I'll just do anything you want and, you know, it doesn't matter. Um, you know, and again, I, I often use the analogy that if someone was really struggling, say with depression and really struggling to get out of bed and really struggling to motivate themselves, would the compassionate thing to be to say, I'll oh, just stay in bed, doesn't matter. You know, you can do anything you want, you know, it's absolutely fine with me. Um, I guess we'd want to, to sort of empathize with someone, but we also might want to help them think about, well, how could we help you? You know, what, what would we need to do to help you overcome um, how you're feeling or to kind of improve your mood? So I guess compassion can still very much be linked to action, but it's more about the kind of emotional content of how we feel moment to moment and how we, um, yeah, how we do 
sort of treats ourselves essentially how we relate to ourselves. again compassion.org i think if you type in also compassionate mind um paul gilbert who again is he's a british psychologist who's written a lot about self-compassion um has written a couple of books there's a lot of um, stuff online so again if you type in compassionate mind paul gilbert um you'll get a lot of kind of stuff up there which again talks about compassionate mind training and how we can um engage with that see a few more someone's put yeah and i think this is one of the ones that was submitted earlier about kind of mental load and how to manage it having lots in our heads at any one time and again i think this is such a sort of common thing again in sort of modern working culture that we just have so much to juggle again if we have a family if we have you know so many demands placed on us at work you know if we have other things going on you know maybe with our own health or kind of things that are stressful you know it can feel like we're juggling so much and again i suppose we sort of have two options in that situation you know we can either try and reduce the demands on us you know maybe we need to say no more you know maybe we need to try and not take as much on again often that's not possible but sometimes it is possible because maybe we're following a sort of narrative or a you know a sense that we always have to say yes we always have to do more to be kind of respected or treated well so i guess if we're noticing that that could be something that we try and do or change in terms of reducing demands but i guess the other thing is just actually mitigating or trying to get support around those things you know so are there other people in my life that can help me manage the stress um are there ways that i can kind of use say mindfulness or relaxation to help me you know, just take my mind off some of these things so I'm not feeling like I'm constantly worrying and constantly kind of stay, keeping myself in that really stressed headspace and just having those moments in the day where we do have a little bit of headspace from, you know, being constantly on and distracted and, you know, feeling like we need to be thinking about something. Again, there's loads online for sort of training in mindfulness. Obviously there is, I use the term headspace. There's the app called Headspace, which I'm sure many of you will have heard of. Short kind of mindfulness relaxation those little breaks in the day of trying to kind of just change our physiology and kind of feel more relaxed can really help with um, mental load and kind of starting to feel really overwhelmed Um, so yes i think again hopefully that answers some of the question Um, but again it's not easy Uh, i think i really empathize with you on that one because i often feel like i'm juggling a million and one things in my head and it's just about trying to find some time to take my mind off things um let's see so again a couple which seem about sort of related to what i just talked about in terms of struggling to switch off at night someone's mentioned about an unwanted adrenaline reaction and again i suppose in terms of how we're wired, like I talked about before, we do have this kind of fight or flight response within our body that when we experience stress or something that feels threatening to us, and again, I'd emphasize the feels threatening to us because it's unlikely we're finding ourselves in a situation where our life is genuinely threatened by an external threat, you know, like um, someone attacking us or kind of animal coming towards us like it might have done again 100,000 years ago the physiological response is heightened heartbeat, um, breathing faster, sweating, racing mind often, you know, kind of really trying to, um, or finding it really hard to kind of switch off. Um, And again, I suppose there are certain things we know that physiologically help to calm us down. So that can be certain types of breathing exercise. Um, It can be physical activity and exercise. Actually, there's some evidence that spending time in green space, you know, in sort of trees, that actually lowers the cortisol response in our body. Um, again, mindfulness and taking our, you know, I guess if we're if the if the content of why we're feeling stressed and anxious is our thoughts, because we're just thinking about, you know, I've got a hundred things to do tomorrow. I'm thinking about the things that happened before. Um, you know, it's the thinking that's generating that anxious state in our body. Then we might have to think about well 
are there ways that I can learn to have a little bit more control over where my mind is going? And again, that brings in awareness, that brings in mindfulness, that brings in kind of maybe some of the ideas in CBT that we talked about in terms of just stepping back and questioning some of the catastrophic thoughts that might be coming up. You know, am I thinking in a very catastrophic way? And if I step back from that, can I notice that, um, you know, maybe things aren't quite as bad as I'm imagining or I'm kind of, again, catastrophizing. Now, again, I'm saying this like it's really easy. These things are really hard. You know, these are things we talk about in therapy. These are things that there's lots and lots of um, techniques and ideas that can take a lot of time to practice. You know, and again, mindfulness, for example, something that it's very much within our culture is something we know is good for us, but actually cultivating a mindful practice, you know, does require a lot of practice. It requires a lot of time. It requires kind of actually, you know, really, um, I suppose, committing to that as something that would be be useful. Um, so yeah, again. So I'm just gonna have a look at a few more. Um, someone's put a question about imposter syndrome, um, which again I think comes up a lot in therapy and I think just in general. I suppose often that links to, I mean, again, people define imposter syndrome in different ways, but I guess my understanding of it has always been <coughs> feeling that somehow we're not going to measure up, you know, everyone else has it sussed and, you know, they kind of know what they're doing. And if people find, you know, I'm almost hiding the fact that I don't really know what I'm doing, you know, I, I could be kind of discovered as a fraud or someone that, you know, really isn't as competent as people think I am. And I guess in my experience, everyone feels like that at some point in their career and probably at multiple times through their career you know even the most experienced you know consultants or therapists or psychiatrists that I've worked with generally and again this is something we actually do in reflective practice when we're thinking about our work we all feel like that at times you know, we all feel like oh do I really know what I'm doing you know am I really actually um, as competent as I kind of project to other people and to some extent all our professions you know if we're in a professional job you know, whether that's um, in law, psychology, medicine, um, we're kind of having to wing it to some extent because it's not something that um, comes naturally to us necessarily. So I think sometimes just the kind of knowing that it's such a common experience can actually take some of the power out of feeling like, oh, it must just be me that feels this way, or it's just me that thinks I'm not as good as maybe other people think I am. And that can be quite liberating because then it's actually, well, am I always having to project this idea that I know exactly what I'm doing because of a fear that if I'm honest about the fact that sometimes I don't know what I'm doing, that will be judged very harshly. And again, I know some work environments are quite cutthroat and people do react differently, but I think sometimes actually being open and honest about how I'm feeling like, oh, you know, I, I'm really not quite sure what to say to that or how to react to that. And again, I don't know I work in psychology so we are we do tend to kind of think in in these ways but I think sometimes just trying to drop that idea that I have to always present myself as someone who's completely infallible and perfect um, can be quite liberating when it comes to imposter syndrome and being that we have to kind of have that facade on at all times um, yeah Okay, there's a few more on there. Um, do I think lockdown was the wrong choice for our health? That is a controversial question. Um, I don't necessarily think that. I think, you know, given the effect COVID has, if it's left to just kind of um, spread within a population with no social distancing or lockdown, I think on balance, lockdowns probably were a good thing you know whether they could have been facilitated in a slightly more effective way where we, kind of, we went in and out of lockdowns regularly I mean I think obviously the impact lockdown is happening having on our health is again increased activity you know less opportunities to move potentially social isolation lack of security if we're sort of, you know losing our pay or you know job insecurity so there's definitely you know, going to be a national cost 
on physical and mental health as a result of lockdown. And I guess it's just weighing that up against what it would have been like if we hadn't done that. You know, again, my, my intuition says it's still probably better that we did lockdown and we kind of do those things. But it's certainly there will be, you know, there have, have been and will be costs further down the line in terms of health. And I think we're already seeing some of the stats around kind of certain types of mental health difficulties becoming more prevalent um partly because of the results of actually having to be more isolated and being yeah again in a sort of national lockdown so yeah um okay i think that's most of the questions i'm just gonna have a look if there was any more that were submitted if anyone's put them in there Someone's put, someone put a question about um, what breathing exercises I would recommend. I mean, again, there's loads out there and some of them are more evidence-based than others. I mean, one that's often used in meditative practices is something called um, box breathing. And again, if you type that into YouTube or type it in online, there's loads of kind of audio. And essentially it's called box breathing because it's about controlling your inhalations and exhalations. So if you imagine a square, the idea is you would, um, say breathe in for five seconds hold your breath for five seconds exhale for five seconds and then hold for five seconds so it's kind of and then repeat that process so it's a kind of rhythmic breathing which can certainly help tap into um, again sort of physiologically calming um, mind and body states again that takes practice <laughs> it's not that we just do that and instantly we feel relaxed and calm but if we can kind of foster that as a practice, that can be something that we can tap into at those moments where we feel really overwhelmed or stressed or just want to give ourselves a kind of mental break, which helps us feel calmer. Um, I think someone just put in the chat about maintaining focus. Um, and again, that's a hard one because there's so many distractions. <laughs> you know, there's so many things that especially working from home, I find distract us, you know, whether it's TV, smartphone, emails, notifications, you know, browsing the web, um, online shopping, you know, there's so many. And I think, you know, one of the things might be to just try and reduce the amount of distractions that I have in my life when I'm, you know, say if I'm trying to work on something, you know, turning my smartphone off, putting it in the bedroom, um, turning off my email notifications um, I know there are some like software you can buy that sort of block websites during certain hours um, you know these kind of things can sometimes help with focus um, I guess you know again all the kind of things I've talked about already like am I really tired because I haven't slept well you know we're going to have less cognitive capacity to focus how much am I being physically active you know actually one of the things that one of the there's some research around kind of physical activity where because we're increasing blood flow to the brain and kind of oxygen to the brain our cognitive functioning actually goes up directly after doing a short period of moving and again that doesn't mean we have to like you know run a 5k that could literally be going for a 10 15 minute brisk walk around the block that will actually tend to mean we come back with a better ability to focus because well one we've just given ourselves a break and trying to focus for long periods is really hard but also because we're actually we've just biologically made our brain function slightly better um so i suppose all those things can have an impact on how much we're able to concentrate um and, and you know just the, the sort of things that affect concentration essentially um might just answer a couple more and then i'll hand back to clara because i'm aware of time Someone's put sort of about what exercise and diet do you suggest? And I think that again is a really hard one to answer. I think with the term exercise and kind of physical activity, some people have very preconceived ideas about what exercise should and shouldn't be. So again, you know, does it have to be running, lifting weights, doing something really intense, which actually maybe we really don't enjoy? And I guess I would say the best activity or exercise is something that we genuinely do find quite enjoyable. 
or something that we can tolerate you know so that could be dancing it could be you know taking up a hobby that I haven't tried before or something that I used to do when I was younger but never did it you know team sports um you know kickboxing though you know anything which I'm probably going to be more drawn to it because I actually enjoy it rather than something I just feel like I have to push myself to do because it's good for me um and obviously that's going to be very subjective for everyone I guess also things which particularly when we're starting aren't so physically strenuous they just make us feel like we hated doing it you know so again um, if, if we say we are trying to get back into running rather than trying to like push ourselves to run a 5k in the time that we were able to run it five years ago or could we start with just like walking very you know and then maybe doing like a minute of running and actually the, the app which many of you will have heard of called couch to 5k very much helps with this because it asks us actually to walk for a lot of the time and just build up that habit of actually you know, running you know and, and being outside and then when we actually get physically fitter we're then able to maybe increase the amount that we're moving and the amount that we're running and in terms of diet again it's hard for me to make specific recommendations i mean i'm not trained as a dietitian um but generally good advice in terms of the evidence is to try and eat things that aren't heavily processed um you know so things that essentially going back to our evolutionary story are existing kind of close to what their natural form would be so you know um unprocessed meats you know if we're going to eat meats um things like rice and grains um again uh, i won't say too much more on that but essentially yeah the, the kind of more processed or the more that it's become kind of man-made and artificial generally the, the worse it is for us you know as a kind of general rule of thumb um so that's kind of what i'd say to that i'm aware we're sort of 20 past so um Clara, i don't know if we want to end there or what, what do you think yeah i think that's probably about well, all we wanted to thank Joshua on behalf of the inn for a really excellent presentation and sure all the big issues and you've covered so many areas so really grateful to you for coming along today and having you on board so thank you very much for coming everyone and um have a good evening yeah thanks guys thanks for having me and um yeah